All right. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am honored to have as my guest today, Dr. Judith Orloff. Judith, welcome to the podcast. Oh, I'm very glad to be here. Awesome. Appreciate it. So Dr. Judith Orloff is a psychiatrist, an empath, New York Times bestselling author. Her new book is The Empath's Survival Guide, Life Strategies for Sensitive People. The book is an invaluable resource to help sensitive people of all kinds develop healthy coping mechanisms in our high stimulus world without experiencing compassion, fatigue, or burnout. Then em empaths can fully embody their gifts of intuition, creativity, spirituality, and compassion. Dr. Orloff specializes in treating empaths and highly sensitive people in her Los Angeles-based private practice. And she believes that the power of the of empathy will save the world. She synthesizes the pearls of traditional medicine with cutting edge knowledge of intuition, energy, and spirituality. And her work has been featured on the Today Show, CNN, the Oprah Magazine, PBS, Psychology Today, and the USA Today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So before we get going here, share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. In terms of geographical location? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like where were where you from originally? Where were you born? Where did it all start? Yeah, I was born in Philadelphia. And I'm currently um, in Venice, California. Okay. And um, empath from the beginning. Empath in Philadelphia. Empath in California. Always an empath. Okay. In terms well, of my temperament. Let's um start at the beginning how, how did this start for you how did this whole becoming a be, recognizing that you're an empath and what is an empath how did this all start well I, i'm a psychiatrist currently and i have been for many many years and it's been my pure joy it's the perfect profession for me and I combine my traditional medical skills with being an empath and being an empath means being open intuitively to other people's energy, um, where they're at, their emotions, and being able to read them on an intuitive level, um, which I incorporate with my traditional scientific skills. So, and I just want to say it's a beautiful balance and anyone out there in training or as a therapist or healthcare provider, m one of my messages is you can combine those two. One is not mutually exclusive to the other. However, in the early days when I was born, I think I was born an empath. I don't think when you say, when did it start? I don't think it started at any point. I think I always was one. Well, I meant when did you recognize it and realize it? You know that you well, I knew something was going on as a very young child because I couldn't go into shopping malls or crowded places because I would go in feeling fine and walk out exhausted or anxious or with some ache or pain I didn't have before. And I'd go to my parents who were both physicians and um they would say, Oh dear, you just need to get a thicker skin. You have to get tougher. And, and that is not the solution if you're an empath listening to this but I felt that there was something wrong with me because they never I never once had anyone who said honey this is a great skill and you need to learn how to set healthy boundaries mm -hmm. meditate center yourself make choices about people and take charge of your own energy I, I had nothing you mm -hmm. know in the beginning I had nothing though so I kind of grew up there was some thinking there was something wrong with me and how did you manage that? I mean, did you go see a therapist? Did you, uh, how, how, did, how did you deal with that? Because that's, that's tough growing up like that. Yeah, and I, I know I'm not alone. I mean, I'm telling everyone the story because I know there are many of you out there who can relate to not having your empath ability to support it. Um, but what happened was that I got heavily involved with drugs and alcohol when I was a teenager in an attempt to run from my abilities and squash them or make it possible for me to go to parties without getting overwhelmed. Um, and so I got really heavily involved 
And then I had a car accident where I went over a cliff in a car up in Topanga Canyon. Oh my God. And went over eight times. Eight wow. times. Yeah, yeah. And during that accident, I went to that the tunnel that people talked about after that. They hadn't been talking about it. This is <laughs> So I didn't know what it was, but I do know that it kept me safe. And it was after that that my parents forced me to go see a psychiatrist because they felt like I was killing myself. And so, you know, the way life is, my life is, I'm very blessed. I got sent to a man who was able to see that a lot of my problem was I wasn't accepting my empathic intuitive ability. Wow. I needed to be whole. And so he helped me through his care and understanding to begin to integrate it. And he sent me over to Thelma Moss, who was a parapsychologist at UCLA then. And I worked as a volunteer in her lab. So it, it started for me, the, the support started around that that point, but it was a you know torturous mm -hmm, journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, you mentioned earlier first and thank you for, for sharing that. You mentioned earlier that you know, for those uh, listeners who uh can 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 recognize and, and and feel that they are an, an empath. You said that you know, man, merging your role as a psychiatrist and an empath are, are are very natural. And yet, I think you would agree that in our society, some might say that they're at opposite ends, right? Yeah. Being a being a physician, and so how how did you did you merge those two? Well, I've had the kind of life, and I'm, I'm just not exclusively me, but when I'm in need of guidance or a turning point, I tend to meet people who can help me get there. So if I don't know what direction to go, then I'll meet someone. And so I met, during my psychiatric training at UCLA, I met this wonderful child psychiatrist named Scott May, who said to me at that point in the 80s, I think you ought to go study with Blue Joy, who is a wonderful teacher out in the high desert in California. Yes, he is a physician who is able to translate all of this, you know, into his work. And so Brew was my first teacher. So I went out for two weeks off the grid. Uh -huh. that, that was really big for me back then, you know, and, and um, began to immerse myself in who I was and what it meant to be around empathic people. And I had a, you know, I write about all this in my first book, Second Sight, which is my, more my memoir. But I, I had a very special friend back then, Michael Crichton, the author, who was also, you know, at Bruce workshop, my very first workshop and his very first workshop. And we bonded and we were like spiritual buddies during that time and went around and investigated things with our, you know, li our literal minds, our scientific minds. And it was just great. It was a perfect person for both of us. We were good, good people for each other at that point. So for those listening who are saying to themselves, wow, I think this is really making sense to me. How does someone know if they are an empath? And how well, do you distinguish between, you know, you talked about, going into a store perfectly fine and walking out a, a, a rack in a sense, how does one distinct will distinguish, you know, is there something wrong with me? You know? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. I just want to encourage everyone who's been told that it's a very negative message and it isn't how you approach anything that there's something wrong with you. Never. I mean, even if, I don't know if you, if you had, you know, a major mental, quote, mental illness, I wouldn't approach it as if there's something wrong with you. Sure, sure. I would approach it as this is my challenge in life and this is what I need to work with in myself. So in answer to your question, in the front of the empath survival guide, there's a 20 question self-assessment test to determine if you are an empath. And there are questions such as, do I absorb other people's emotions? Have I been labeled as, quote, overly sensitive all my life and shamed for my abilities? Do I get drained by noise, crowds, or excessive talking? 
So there, there are just a few sample questions, but you can go through the test in the front of the Empath Survival Guide and take the test. It's 20 questions, and you could diagnose yourself how much of an empath you are. Uh, it's divided into an extreme empath, moderate empath, or slightly an empath. And I just want to say, even if you only score, let's say, one or two questions, yes, it's still relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, because you have this absorptive tendency that empaths have. It's very important that you learn how to work with that so you don't absorb other people's pain or stress or the world's stress. I mean, it's inevitable sometimes when, you know, if you're with a relative, say, who's going through a, a horrible health challenge that's, that's really rigorous and you, you might want to, you might take on some of their stuff because your heart is with them so much. But in most cases, you want to have a, a definite boundary between you and the other person um, so that you don't get overly involved in everyone's problems and life. Now, there is suffering here on earth. This is a fact. Mm -hmm. I'm suffering. You're suffering. Everybody has their degree of suffering, some more than others at particular times. But that's something to accept. That isn't something to go in if you're in the market going shopping and you feel a wave of somebody suffering come by you. It's like, you know, God bless, you know, namaste. Mm -hmm. you know, just send them uh, some heart energy. It's none of your business to get into their suffering mm -hmm. at the market. And mm -hmm. I, I know many empaths, you know, they'll say, you know, I feel you're having a hard time. Can I help you? Like strangers. Like, mm -hmm. No. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. It sounds it sounds uh, a little bit like you're uh, inviting us to really develop an awareness and a recognition of the fact that some of us are empaths. Just like that that you said that doctor said to you, he acknowledged what was going on for you, and it really was empowering. You know, because I can I can sense that a lot of us go into that store and yes, totally absorb. Uh, the energy from the many people that we're experiencing, a lot of it can be negative, but you're saying here, it's okay to develop that boundary, to recognize that there is a, there is a boundary there. There is. And you can send people heart energy just by focusing on something you love and just send them a little blip of heart energy that will do more good than all your worrying and ruminating and thinking and what should I do you don't want to do any of that you just want to send them a little heart energy and move on your way that's what empaths don't know how to do they get mm -hmm. mesmerized by other people's problems and suffering and it comes from a place of a good heart I want to say that but if you want to survive as an empath and you want to be a healthy empath and really enhance your own gifts you can't do that. It's too exhausting. The world is full of, you know, a lot of pain now, you know, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And, you know, you just have to stay in your own home, your home of yourself and your own belief systems. And first of all, identify if you're an empath, take the self-assessment quiz, then ask yourself, how could I begin to set more boundaries in my life? What can mm -hmm. I do? And just start with one thing at a time. Read the book, read slowly. There are all kinds of strategies that I use in my life as an empath. And that's why I wanted to share them with you because they work. If they didn't work, I wouldn't do them. Well, share share one or two with us, if you would. Let's get specific here. Um, something very simple is if you're around negative energy or if somebody is, is draining you, um, keep breathing. Don't hold your breath because when you hold your breath, that keeps whatever is going on inside your body. You want to keep using the breath. The breath is a tool for empaths because it circulates any energy you might have picked up and circulates it back out of the body. But biologically, people hold their breath when they get scared. So I want everyone to notice, how are you with people? If you're around a really difficult person, are you sitting there clenching and holding your breath? And if you are, fine, just notice it and say, all right, I'm going to start breathing again. You know, that, that's really simple. Um, and also, it's important to learn shielding techniques. Some people really love Shielding? It. Yeah, shielding. Shield. You picture a beautiful light 
filled shield all around you that's warm and cozy and protective and doesn't let any kind of difficulties in. It's a protective shield and many therapists use it if they're with difficult patients. They'll mm -hmm. put the shield up so they don't, you know, they aren't barraged by what's happening. And that's fine. You know, it's fine to use a shield. And it's also important to set verbal boundaries. And this is the workshop I'm giving on August 5th, a Zoom workshop on how do you set boundaries in, in relationships if you're an empath? How do you communicate in a positive way your needs? Because empaths typically don't speak up. They mm -hmm. sit there, they suffer. How do you express your needs? And so the workshop is on August 5th and it's on my website, drjudithorloff.com online workshop. Okay, we'll have that linked up here at the show notes page um, at the Books Read Thrive podcast. So, what are you know? We've talked a lot about how to how to manage as as an empath, but what about just the the gifts of being an empath? And I yeah. could think of many, but share with us from your perspective. Oh my God! How They're, do they bloom? Where do they shine? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> They're just shining lights. <laughs> yeah. So I me, mean, I, you know, love and accept, I try and love and accept everyone, but the empaths, you know, feel because I've had that experience in my life. I, I can relate to my fellow empaths. I feel a kind of camaraderie with them because I, it's a similar journey that many of us go through. Um, but the gifts include intuition. It includes being able to sense what's going on in others, being able to connect to others with your heart. You're not numb and withdrawn and cold. You're, if anything, overly effusive, you know, and trying to connect. So the boundary is just hold yourself back. A little bit of detachment is good. Mm -hmm. um, but the connection to nature, I know in my life, I'm really connected to nature. I I'm all I'm always out in nature, either hiking or walking by the beach or looking up at the sky. And I look up at the stars every night you know, after I meditate. Um, and being able to love, you know, to really love. Empaths are loving, giving people, and they enjoy the experience of loving. Um, but there's, I just want to say though, there's another chapter in the book on the toxic attraction between empaths and narcissists. Yes, empaths may love the wrong people because they give them an extra chance or an extra mm. ten years, or they're going to change, or they say things like, oh, he or she went through such a terrible childhood. It's just going to take them time to heal. Mm -hmm. Now, these are traps that empaths fall for because of their open heart. And you, know, you basically can't change anybody. And that's so hard for empaths to get. So you want to be love the right people, um, but it doesn't always happen. So that's a challenge. If you're an empath, just look at it as a challenge on how to how to deal with if you're in a relationship with a narcissist, mm -hmm. do you want to stay in it? If, is it your boss so you can't leave? How to, we'll talk about this in the workshop, but these are all questions, open-ended questions that empaths talk about all the time. You, you mentioned narcissist. We hear a lot about that, I think, in our culture, especially now. How would you define what a narcissist is? <laughs> Being Well, I'm talking about a full-blown malignant narcissist. And um, these are people with what's called empathy deficient disorders, where they're neurologically not wired to feel empathy. So it's so hard for empaths to get this because empaths are super empathy people. Um, but the uh, narcissist is not empathic they mm -hmm. they want power they want to be charming they want control they want worldly recognition um they want you to do what they want you to do and then they have all kinds of punishments if you don't they'll love bomb you so you'll feel all loved in the beginning and then they'll switch to their narcissistic self so there's certain qualities that if you memorize them and you're used to them, you'll see a repeat because sometimes people have this pattern, empaths have a pattern of attracting narcissists because one or more parent was a narcissist. So they're imprinted on that level of intimacy. And part of healing as an empath is to realize that's never going to work for you in any shape or form. 
And if you do need to stay in, let's say, a work situation with a narcissist boss, you must lower your expectations. You must you know, do things in such a way where you're not suffering with the person. You could limit the amount of discomfort you have by having realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting subject, I think, that many empaths delve into as part of their growth. Remind everyone that I'm speaking with Dr. Judith Orloff. We're talking about her new book, The Empath's Survival Guide, Life Strategies for Sensitive People. At what point, Judith, in your in your life, in your in your education, did you say to yourself, okay, I, I think I got a hang of being an empath? Like were you in medical school at the time when you started to own it and and appreciate it? Yeah, uh, not really. Um, and, and plus, I don't think I ever felt I had the hang of being an empath because it's so multidimensional and mm. there's so many aspects to it that you can continue to unfold as I grow. You know, as I grow older, the older you get, the more you get to learn about this beautiful ability. And um, so it grows. It's like an ongoing path. I look at it for me as a spiritual path you know, of growth and learning how to connect to the universe and to people and to love as love is all there is. And the whole point of all this is to learn how to love yourself and love others. So we have a chance at getting along here, you know? <laughs> and so um, you just keep learning. And that's mm -hmm. what I love about it. I don't feel a need to know it all with i don't think it's possible it's not of that course. thing yeah yeah um who's the book for the book is for everyone but it's for all you empaths who hadn't been recognized and been told that you know there's something wrong with you and you're shamed and you might feel like you don't belong in this world as i as i did and that there's nobody you can relate to and you're trying to fit into a mold that doesn't fit you, all of those people, yes. It's also for empaths who do have a little bit of self-knowledge and want to go deeper in mm -hmm. terms of practices of becoming more of an empath. The idea isn't to become less of an empath, it's mm -hmm. to become more of an empath. So it's not just damage control, it's about how do I get to a point of, of, of certain comfort level of setting boundaries of saying no to people and, you know, having more control of what energy goes in and out. And then let's say in your meditation practice to really let yourself go, you know, to really feel, you know, a sense of spirit and bring that into your life or a connection to your heart to spend time. I, every night at the end of the day, I sit, at my altar, I light my candles, light my incense, keep the window open. So if I'm lucky, I can hear the ocean, which is a few blocks away. And I sit there and it's just, I let everything in without being guarded. If I'm too in my head, that sometimes mm -hmm. I sit there. I look like I'm meditating, but my <laughs> head is going like that. So I just practice self-empathy and I say, that's okay. Take a breath center yourself, start over again, and just feel. It's not a matter of thinking. Meditation is not a matter of thinking. It's a matter of, I'm an empath, and I'm going to let myself feel what this is, this mm -hmm. meditation experience, which is so sacred to me. And meditation is something I recommend to a lot of empaths, if you can sit still. But mm -hmm. sometimes empaths, like if they have ADHD, um, it's hard for them to sit still. So I would recommend going out for a walk, moving your body rhythmically, being aware of your soles of your feet touching the ground, doing earthing, grounding. Some empaths need more grounding. So it just depends on where you're at. But if you can sit still, meditation is a beautiful thing. And to have a sacred space, an altar, where you can have um, candles and incense and flowers and you know have reverence for the mm -hmm. spirituality of, of everyday life you know to show reverence that's part of being an empath is to connect to these beautiful forces that are around us and talk, uh, very 
it, it'll bring, it'll make you have light. The older you get, the more light you're going to give off if you practice this. You, you talked about your workshop uh, and in part an opportunity to create uh, a community where people would feel safe, where empaths would feel safe. And I, I, I can feel how amazing that would be. And, and as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, the world in which we're living in and not to be negative because I'm not, but as you said, I mean, there's a lot of hard stuff going out there. And I think to going on out there, rather, I think to, to be an empath, someone who feels so, so much, it seems like we've really challenged to, to be an empath in this world. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Uh, however, it's doable. Of course, um, of course. Because something's hard or even impossible. You know, there are all kinds of good reasons not to show empathy, all kinds of good sure. reasons. <laughs> but you you don't want to do that. Of you want to you have to come about it from a different angle than what society is doing right now. They're, in my opinion, on the wrong path, you know, in terms of human beings. And and it, because I believe as an empath and just as a per human being, it's about love, it's about coming together, it's not about, you know polarizing and all that and so even if you know a lot of the world is doing all these things that you might think are just not healthy that doesn't stop you from being healthy mm -hmm. that doesn't you help stop you from engaging your empath self and developing and adding more light to the world in spite of everything that's going on and yes there's it's outrageous it's horrible it, it's overwhelming and it it is it is at the moment, and we're all born into it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, there's a certain karma to that. Why are we all alive today? Mm -hmm. you know, hopefully it's to better the world, no matter what is going on on the outside. You don't want to be thrown off or give up or lose faith. You want to have faith in, in what you know is an empath, the power of the heart, um, the blessing of intuition, the value of healthy, loving relationships. Um, not needing to be right all the time, but being able to intuitively listen to other people and at least listen to their point of view. Um, so there's all kinds of things you can do. But yes, it is a very demanding situation now, certainly more demanding than it was, let's say, 20 years ago when I was developing this. But it it is what it is, and we're all here together. So just depends on what you believe. If you really believe in something, as I do, I really believe in everything I'm talking about. You do it, even if no one else is doing it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you do it because you believe in it. And belief is strong. And it takes time to develop having belief in yourself and belief in your values and the, the beauty of these values. You know, mm -hmm. whenever you're in doubt, just move towards the heart. Just ask yourself, what would my heart do? Or how does my heart need to take care of itself now? Or or how how can not talking to this person help me now? And that's mm -hmm. all, you know, it's all okay. I, I, I love what you're saying. I mean, you're 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 very empowering. You, you know, you I feel like you're giving us the the uh ability to accept who we are, you know, and that's very powerful. Yeah, it is. It is. And I hope everyone could feel their own power. Um, as I, I read a, a meme recently, and I really liked it. It was that narcissists want to take your power away, but loving people want you to come into your own power. Mm. You know, you want to be with people who want you to come into your own power, not take it away from you because mm -hmm. they want power over you. There's a big difference. And so you want to go towards the love. You want to, you know, go towards the heart. Simple people coming from the heart are the most powerful of all. You don't have to have a lot of external this or that. If you come from your heart, these are the people you want to be around. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so glad you're here, Judith. Well, once again, we're speaking with Dr. Judith Orloff. Uh, the book is The Empath's Survival Guide, Life Strategies for Sensitive People. Where can people get the book? Uh, you can get it on my website, drjudithorloff.com. -O -O -F -F it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble. It's on Goodreads. It's everywhere. 
you know, than online uh, uh, books are sold. And also it's in bookstores around. Okay. So it's really easy to find. Okay. And your workshop, which is going to be uh, a live Zoom workshop, tell us a little bit more about that, where people can find out about that. Oh, you could find out again on my website, drjudithorloff.com. And it's um, August 5th, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you can't come live, we'll have the recording for you because I know people are enrolling from all over the world and in different time zones. Um, but it, it's how to improve your communication and relationships if you're an empath. You know, how do you set boundaries? How do you set limits? How do you assert your needs? What are some issues that come up for you in your relationships? Not just intimate, well, intimate could mean many things and not just like a love relationship, mm -hmm. all relationships. Relationships could be with your animal companion. You could be having some issues, mm -hmm. you know? It's true, you know? Yeah. It's, it's true. So you know, anybody with your boss, with your friends, how do you deal with all this as an empath and not be drained and mm. also feel good about yourself and to come from the highest place? So um, come join us August 5th, 11 a.m., 1 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and it's on drjudithorloff.com. Okay. And again, we'll have that linked up. Uh, all those, everything we've talked about here linked up at the show notes page at the books read thrive podcast.com. Judith, you are a light. You are a, a source. You're beaming. You've got your energy is amazing. Thank you so much for, for really for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. All right. Take care.